The Rubicon, starring Jeremy Winston and Drew. Facebook or Twitter, right? I mean, we all we all are have these lightning bolt moments, and uh, uh, we we feel like we we have something we want to post, uh, and and that is that is deep, and or share something that is deep. But there's there's some that you have uh, you have uh, you shared recently uh, a couple of times on your page that has really made me sit back and think. And um, if you don't mind, I'm going to just read read it uh, directly. It was, it was on January 10th, and. And it said, Charlie, you, you, this is your post. And Jeremy said, he said, Charlie Brown is a sad figure because he can't, he can't kick the ball no matter how hard he tries. In good times, James Evans couldn't get his family out of the ghetto no matter how hard he tried. So it is that the head cold of Charlie Brown's sadness becomes the influenza of James Evans' tragedy. Here's why James Evans is my hero. He didn't die with the flu. He lived with the flu until he died. And, all, and every, I, I've read that a few times, and I've always made me think. And I, I also need to say for any listeners who were uh, born after, you know, in the 80s or 90s, uh, James Evans is the father from Good Times, uh, and uh, Charlie Brown is the uh, uh, the cartoon character that comes on every Thanksgiving and Christmas with the dog. If, you, if you're not familiar with Charlie Brown or James Evans, but I'm pretty certain the majority of my listeners are familiar with that, with those two characters, and and can I and can relate uh, with uh, this, with with your uh, with, with with what you've written, and I wanted for you, I wanted to ask if you can unpack that a little for us and talk mm-hmm. about the, the philosophy of of comparing Charlie Brown and James Evans. Sure. Well, I think what happens is in my reflections on culture, given my background in philosophy. I am reminded of how badly philosophy fails in providing a rational and comprehensive account of all that is. It doesn't mm-hmm. take it, it, you don't have to have a PhD in philosophy to come to the conclusion that there are some things that just seem to defy rational explanation. Mm-hmm. We in our in our popular culture, we like to come up with self help books and we like to have neat little formulas that say to us, "If you do this, this, and this, this is a guarantee for success right and this kind of formulaic thinking sort of formulaic sort of cliched thinking spills its way over into various parts of our culture, spills mm-hmm. itself over into a popular theology that mm-hmm. says all you have to do is these things and God will bless you and he'll give right. you many things and you'll live a life of abundance and so forth and so on. And and so as I, as I think about that and, and as I think about the the real reflections on what it is to to be male in in mm-hmm. some sense what it is to be male and to experience one's existence as a male as a man i i reflect on charlie brown and james evans as tragic figures of mm-hmm. masculinity there there's a, there's a wonderful phrase that has been coined by Bishop T.D. Jakes in a sermon of his called He Motions, where Mm -hmm. he speaks of what he calls the chaos of masculinity. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, the chaos of masculinity is a cauldron composed of all of the demands and all of the responsibilities and all of the hopes and dreams and wishes that a man has while trying to do things like take care of family, have career ambitions, and all the while never spreading himself too thin 
in in that sense, a man exists in this moment where he is pulled mm -hmm. in a million different directions and is expected to fulfill the demands of each of those directions, which mm -hmm. is oftentimes, frankly, unreasonable. Right. And when we usually, usually the way our culture and the way our society treats men is sort of like how we're going to have the Super Bowl next Sunday. So I think a football analogy might work nicely here. Uh -huh, sort of uh -huh. how you, you never hear much about an offensive lineman unless there's a holding penalty. Right. And it's often like that with men. We rarely say good things about men. Men are often taught to be self-deprecating, and the only time we hear something about men is often when they've done something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I was thinking of a way to conceptualize the tragic dimensions of Charlie Brown and James Evans and have them as examples of what Bishop Jakes calls the chaos of masculinity. And so in Charlie Brown's case, Charlie is sort of walking through the park, kind of minding his business, mm -hmm. and Lucy says to him, Charlie, come on, do you want to kick the football? And at first, Charlie says, no, if I try to do that, then I'm going to fall flat on my back. You're going to move the ball. So it's obvious that Charlie has a history with Lucy, right? Right, that, right. That Lucy has he, has, he has indulged her desire for companionship, and uh -huh. it, it has not worked out well for him. <laughs> okay. And, and and so he says, if I go to kick the ball, you're going to move it, and I'm going to fall flat on my back. And mm -hmm. then through a very interesting appeal to tradition, Lucy says, no, Charlie, I wouldn't deceive you on Thanksgiving. K mm -hmm. The kicking off of football is one of the biggest traditions. And so mm -hmm. through an appeal to tradition, Charlie is sort of, sort of duped into making one more attempt to kick the ball even though he knows it historically has not worked out. And so he runs to kick it. He tries his hardest, but no matter how hard he tries, he can't kick it. And once again, Lucy moves the ball, and he falls flat on his back. So I thought to myself, how many men are there in our culture that are duped by tradition into mm -hmm. thinking that mm -hmm. their relationships with women will somehow – be different or somehow it's going to work out better this time or somehow I'll get a different result because this time I'm going to try harder. And mm -hmm. Charlie Brown represents the frustration of mm -hmm. giving one's best efforts and mm -hmm. falling short. So Charlie followed the formula. He mm -hmm. did what he was supposed to do. He, he obeyed the dictates of tradition. He mm -hmm. indulged Lucy in the game, and he gave it his best, and he winds up flat on his back. Right. So I, I tried to, in the Facebook post that you read, I tried to juxtapose Charlie Brown to James Evans as a spin on the old cliche that if white people catch a cold, black people catch the flu. Right. And so... Right. For Charlie, Charlie's, Charlie is a sad figure, for sure, uh -huh. and, it's some, and somewhat tragic, but more, more sad because he tries his best and he can't. So, in a sense, he's a paradigm of the chaos of masculinity. But mm -hmm. on a deeper level, Charlie only has to worry about Charlie. James Evans has an entire family whose mm -hmm. hopes and dreams and wishes depend on his leadership in the household. And this is not a knock on the Cosby show. Goodness mm -hmm. knows Bill Cosby has enough. He has bigger fish to fry now. Right, he's got a lot on his plate right now. Not, not, a knock on, not, not a knock on the Cosby show at all. But for those who will listen to this, 
who have who were around in the seventies to watch Good Times, it's it's pretty clear, at least to me, that long before there was Heathcliff Huxtable, there was James Evans, a man who worked, a man who stayed at home with his family. James mm-hmm. Evans worked at a car wash where he made two dollars and thirty five cents an hour. He had a family with a wife and three children. He was an honest man. He was a hardworking man. He was a good father, flawed in many ways, but what man is not? The point Mm -hmm. is that James Evans played by the rules, and he always came up short. But Mm -hmm. the, the blessing in beholding James Evans for me is that despite all the times he came up short, he never stopped living, he never stopped laughing, and he never stopped loving. So he didn't die with the flu, so to speak. Right. He lived with the flu until he died. And there's a difference between dying with something and living with something. To mm-hmm. die with something suggests a sort of resignation, uh, a giving up, a a turning away from, a surrender. It overcame James, you. This, this thing overcame you. That's right. That's right. And James Evans refused to do that. He he suffered from his disappointments, but he kept living and he kept mm-hmm. laughing and he mm-hmm. kept loving. He loved his wife. He loved his children. He worked hard. Even though he got knocked down, he kept getting back up again. And to to live in that way shows a level of courage that, to me, helps to overcome his tragic circumstances. Sports talk, ministry, politics. That's right. You are listening to The Rubicon, starring Jeremy Winston, only on Advent Sports Network. Marlon Briscoe was one of the first uh, black quarterbacks to start. He played actually for the Broncos, and uh, this guy was guy was a, a, a great player. I mean, uh, again, mobile, uh, had an arm on him, but the only thing that was held against him was that he was black. James, I like to call it uh, Cam Newton situation, uh, the discount double standard. Okay, <laughs> uh, that's what I call it, man. Straight up, just the discount double standard. I don't know if you saw this thing. It was online somewhere, I thought, where uh, Aaron Rodgers is doing his discount double check move after uh, scoring a touchdown. And somebody said, oh, isn't it great uh, how, how he celebrates? And then somebody showed Cam Newton doing his celebration and said, you know, we need to get these, these wild thugs or this wild stuff out of the league. Advent Sports Network is a 503C charity. All advertising proceeds from the Lance J Radio Show are used to fund nationwide youth sports programs and the Advent Sports Network Mentorship and Development Institute, which provides opportunities for young aspiring Christian journalists to cover athletic events and produce sports-related programming. In 49 BC, Julius Caesar led an army over the Rubicon River from Gaul into northern Italy. By doing so, he crossed the point of no return and declaration of war against the Roman Empire. Centuries later, you are listening to Jeremy Winston reach his point of no return only on Advent Sports, the Rubicon. And so when I see Charlie Brown and I see James Evans, I see sadness and I see tragedy, and, and I also see the compelling ways, and I'm sure you can appreciate this, Jeremy, given your background in music, the compelling ways that when, when we get to the end of our ability to explain things rationally, mm-hmm. there is a creative dimension in human beings that helps us to express poetically and artistically what we cannot express through the logic of propositions. 
So it's no accident that both Charlie Brown and James Evans are fictional figures. That is a manifestation of art's compelling ability to, through the use of fiction, portray truth. And this becomes a very important way to understand the human condition because when you when you study music, you as a as a as a musician, as a professional musician, and choir director yourself, understand, for example, Wagner's opera. Wagner's mm -hmm. opera is characterized by what music professionals such as yourself would call dissonance. And and the dissonance becomes and that now I'm talking about a nineteenth century German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. The, right. the, dissonance, the dissonance of Wagner's opera becomes an aesthetic representation of the tragic circumstances of human life. Those mm -hmm. circumstances that lie outside the reach of philosophical explanation. Those right. outliers that cannot be brought within a scheme of intelligibility and neatly packaged in some rational, comprehensive, metaphysical or ontological account of the mm -hmm. world and mm -hmm. we see it in 19th century German music in Richard Wagner but to bring it home even further we also see it or hear it in the music of James Brown exactly. whose, off, whose offbeat rhythms and whose intermittent screams represent the aesthetic portrayal of black life which is often unpredictable, offbeat, and downright frightening. If right. you consider the weeping and wailing of Tamir Rice's family or Laquan McDonald's family. And right. so there's something about the human condition that turns to artistic and creative expression when we are pushed to the limits of human rationality. And in some sense, the first poem spoken ever in the history of the world is Let There Be Light. Because in the midst of darkness, a God, the God who we believe, if you, if you are a Christian, the God who we believe created us, looks into the darkness. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the context of an overwhelming, chaotic, and terrifying picture in Genesis 1-2, becomes creative in the face of that chaos and terror. And he speaks a poetic word and right. light appears. And so human beings, if you buy the Judeo-Christian narrative, are created in the image of a God who does his best creative work in the dark. And so it is that the darkness of our society, the darkness of our culture, the tragic circumstances of James Evans, of the families of black victims whose bodies are left in the street riddled with bullets, and there's no accountability. In some sense, it is, it is there where artistic expression and creativity hold sway. And so I, I, tried, to, I tried to capture some of that in the post about... Charlie Brown and James Evans. Well, you 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 certainly uh, uh, you certainly um, made some great points here that that are, that are going to be that are going to stay with me for the rest of the week. I really want to move forward, uh, mm -hmm. but um, I think we have exhausted our time for uh, this interview. But we have a lot more that we want to cover, um, including uh, some more work uh, that that you're doing uh, at at Walla Walla. I know that you you recently. Uh, published uh, in um, in the book, The Philosophy and the Mixed Race Experience, and we want to bring you back on and talk about that. Uh, uh, Tim Golden, again, uh, Professor Tim Golden, who's Professor of Philosophy and Director of Donald Blake Center, uh, the Donald Blake Center for Race, Ethnicity, and Culture. Thanks for being on the Rubicon um, or Advent Sports Network. Uh, I can't tell you how um, uh, how much this conversation has uh, been compelling and enriching to me, and I'm certain uh, that if my listeners could call in right now, they would say the same thing. Oh, 
Thank you so much, Jeremy. And I was blessed and honored and privileged to have been interviewed on your show. So thank you no. very much for having me. Oh, the, the honor and the privilege is all is is, is all mine. So uh, thank you again, um, uh, Tim Golden, and uh, thanks for listening to the Rubicon with Jeremy Winston. Take care. Okay. Thanks, thanks, right. Jeremy. Bye. Rubicon is an Anderson Talk Radio expansion franchise about current events, news, and geopolitics. All footage is taped in Dayton, Ohio, and produced at Athens Sports Network's downtown studios in the lovely Emerald City of Seattle, Washington.